Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're discussing the future of voting in the United States with our guests, Tom Lopak, President and CEO of the Voter Participation Center, Louis Lozada, CEO of Democracy Works, and Claire Snyder Hall, Executive Director of Delaware Common Cause. Thank you all so much for joining us. This is, the, I mean, let's let us face it. At this time in American history, there is no right that is more important than the right to vote. And these rights are being challenged all across the United States. So let's talk about your views on where we are in the health of our voting system, both at the state level, at the local and state level, and at the federal level. And let's let's uh, uh, tee off with you, Tom. How do you see the health, health of our, our right to vote in the United States today? And how does the Voter Participation Center uh, increase the, our, the state of our, our voter health? I am deeply concerned about the voter health. And Mark, thank you for pulling us all together. Claire and Luis, it's nice to be with you. Uh, we should be having, having a contest of ideas. And instead, we're in a moment where it feels like we're having a contest over who gets to vote, who has the right to vote. It should absolutely be about ideas, uh, philosophies, policy positions, and that's not where we're at. The Voter Participation Center and our partner organization, the Center for Voter Information, uh, send high volume direct mail and digital outreach to people of color, young people, and unmarried women. We know these three communities are underrepresented in our elections. And so the work that we do is to help register them to vote at their current address and help turn them out to vote uh, at the right place at the right time. Um, and what we do is bring democracy to people's smartphones or to their mailboxes. And when we see states pass laws that seek to inhibit access to voting, we will file lawsuits. So far in the past three years, we filed federal lawsuits in Kansas and Georgia as their state legislatures worked to prevent who could have access to vote by mail. And in Kansas, we had a favorable decision uh, at the federal circuit court, and it's now been appealed by the state uh, to the appellate court. And we're still waiting on a decision in Georgia. But the work that we do is bringing democracy directly to people. The thing that I don't understand about our system, I've never really understood it, is that uh, we have a inherent conflict. So much of the uh, mechanisms surrounding voting um, are in party hands, and the party's job is to win. It's not to guarantee everyone's right to vote. So in American history, we have had these movements that are really about restricting the right to vote to only my constituents, isn't it, Lewis? Isn't that true, Lewis? I mean, don't we have this situation where, for example, partisan gerrymandering is absolutely fine. So you have majorities in different states, whether they're uh, Democratic uh, or Republican Party majorities, who uh, shape voting uh, accordingly, as opposed to having a quite neutral uh, voting regimen. We should have a neutral voting regimen, shouldn't we? Uh, we absolutely should, Mark, and thank you for the question. Um, kind of level set here, you know, at Democracy Works, our charge is getting trusted voting information into the hands of voters. And um, to your point about the partisan nature of elections, that's what we call the politics. There's another side of this that's election infrastructure. And if you were to speak to folks that are administering elections, the ones that are not running for public office, these folks are not partisan. They just want to run a good election. And where we come in at Democracy Works is ensuring that voters can kind of sift through the noise of the politicians and get that information that's crucial for them to either getting registered to vote, for finding their polling location, um, for ensuring that if they voted by mail, they're able to ascertain the status of that ballot, whether it was delivered, whether it's on their way back to them. These are the kind of things that often get ignored when you get into the politics of it. But election infrastructure is what supports election administration officials in running good elections that voters can trust. Now, we can't ignore 
the fact that if you've got a secretary of state or an attorney general in a particular jurisdiction that is running on a platform that is partisan, that is seeking to limit the access by vote by mail or by closing polling locations or by um, shrinking the registration periods or the hours of voting, those are very significant issues. Um, as a matter of mission creep, Democracy Works doesn't get into those fights and we're lucky to have uh, folks like Tom that are able to file lawsuits in that regard, what we do is that we ensure that the organizations that are out there seeking to advocate have that trusted voting information so that they can get their constituents out to the ballot box. Because at the end of the day, all of these determinations about who gets to vote and who gets to get registered and when you register, these are policy decisions that are being made by elected officials. And the only way to thwart that is to get out there and vote. And, and you're making such a great point. You're saying that, uh, first of all, having good information is important to the right to vote. Uh, being able to safeguard the ability to vote without intimidation is, is really important. And you're also making uh, the very valid point that while we all might be um, uh, party affiliated, you don't have to, in your, in your um, function as a protector of the right to vote and in voting administration, be tilting the process toward a particular party. You can be completely neutral. That Indeed, that is your job. And the best of those people are really uh, thinking about American democracy writ large and not about whether their particular political party has an advantage or a disadvantage. Claire, can you talk, uh, talk a little bit about Common Cause? You've been around, Common Cause has been around for how long? Uh, 50, 50, a little over 50 years. 50 years, yeah. I mean, I remember from from your, your your real founding. And talk a little bit about what you have done over the years and where where your focus is now. And of course, since you are representing Common Cause Delaware, that's uh, Biden's uh, home state. Um, how does that actually uh, affect, or does it affect, uh, your work in Delaware as Common Cause? Because you're not. You're. I mean, the, here we have another uh, another issue, right? home state, you know, theoretically a loyalty. How do you, to, to, to one side, and you shouldn't have a, lo a loyalty to one side, how do you think about this? Thank you so much for having me on this morning. Um, yes, Common Cause, we at Common Cause, we're a national grassroots organization with over a million and a half members, and we're nonpartisan. And we work on protecting and strengthening democracy. And I am in charge of the Delaware office, as you mentioned. And it's interesting because, you know, part, voting didn't used to be a partisan issue. I remember back at the end of the Cold War, I was in, you know, graduate school at the time and democracy was, was on the rise, right, all over the world. And we had these, these great hopes and now it's, it's under attack all over the country, including in Delaware. Because it used to be, I mean, we are, in Delaware, we always um, prided ourselves on the Delaware way and people coming together and, you know, centrists and you make a phone call and you know people. But hyper-partisanship is a real problem now across the country and even in Delaware, where it doesn't, it's more like who proposed the policy has more weight than what the policy is a lot of times, right? So we had, so we're nonpartisan, but unfortunately the way the parties have shifted our agenda a lot of times aligns better with the Democratic Party than the Republican Party, um, just because of the way um, the extremism has has risen up. So what but you're saying is, is that to, to be nonpartisan in a partisan uh, era, in a sense, you're being defined by what people want you to accede to. And if you don't accede to that, then you are defined as being partisan, but but you're really just trying to uh, maintain uh, neutrality. I think that's a very interesting concept, right? Right, and, and for an example, um, we work on, Common Cause works on uh, the freedom to vote, um, getting money out of politics, ethics and transparency, and also uh, we oppose gerrymandering. Gerrymandering is a great, a great example of the partisanship issue because it's not, it's not partisan, it's whoever has the power Right. uses it to gerrymander to get um, to ensure that their party has an unfair advantage and that it's not the voters who are deciding, but rather incumbent politicians. So that's a great example because in Republican dominated states, the majority party gerrymanders to favor its party. And the same thing happens in Democratic states such as my own. So what is your um, 
what is your uh, view on how uh, districts should be defined? Do you have a particular approach that you think is more fair than the gerrymandered approach and the approach that we have nowadays in state legislatures? Well, we believe that the um, voting districts ought to be uh, centered around communities of interest, right? The districts ought to allow communities to govern, to participate in governing themselves. I mean, that's what democracy is about, right? So instead of drawing districts to make sure certain people get reelected or a certain party gets more members, it should be around communities so that they can choose those who will represent them in the legislature. Um, you, so that's what we try to do. Uh, Lewis, uh, Tom, how do you see the debate unfolding um, where there are positions that you take, but you're taking those positions, uh, for example, Tom, when you're when you're suing somebody, basically you're saying, we can't talk anymore. We're going to sue you to force a, a compliance to a law as we interpret it, right? Lewis, you're providing information. How do you see the this debate unfolding when people are so divided they're not talking to each other? Lewis, how do you how do you encourage that kind of dialogue? If I totally disagree with you, totally, right? How are you go? How is your information going to affect me? I'm not even going to read it. And that is a challenge, and it's why um, our nonpartisan position becomes so important to us. For example, we are the largest purveyor of polling location information in the country, and the way we acquire that data is by working directly with the states. We have relationships with 42 states. If you take that number, there is a significant percentage of it that is not a blue state. And if we are out in the field taking positions that go against the legislatures or the leadership of those states, we no longer get that valuable, da valuable data that allows constituents within those states to get that very necessary information for them to participate in the process. So again, um, I think where we're challenged is that democracy and protecting democracy has become a partisan issue. And that's something that creates, you know, uh, you know, an impossible choice for organizations that want to be involved in ensuring that folks have the ability to vote. But if I put that aside for a sec for a second and say, hey, listen, there's a greater good here insofar as getting the information to voters in all the different communities um, that they need so that they can register their opinion at the poll. That's the path that we take. And that's how we talk about how we're kind of the intel inside. Um, there are organizations out there that are going to be engaged in advocacy and filing lawsuits and um, really lobbying. Um, that isn't our charge. Our charge is in making sure that the voters are informed and other organizations have the tools necessary so that they can get out there. It's kind of the uh, the trade-off that you make when you are a 501c3. You, you're you're a, a benefiting from the public support, but there are certain restrictions in how you operate there. And that's kind of how we, we see it at Democracy Works. You play close to the vest um, and we make sure that our guiding star is, is in service of voters and election administration officials. Um, on, 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 go ahead. You asked about how we work with states that we're suing. Our work is very much voter and potential voter centered. Anytime we are about to run a large voter registration mailing program um, or vote by mail sign up program in a state, we work with the state elections administrators to review and approve, edit, suggest changes to our mailings. So we work closely. Just because a particular legislature passed a law doesn't mean that we can't both sue and work closely with. The legislatures. Um, I do want to build on the C3 status. I don't know everybody's uh, or how we are organized, but I believe we are all C3s, which according to the law demands that we be nonpartisan. And it sounds like all three of us embrace our nonpartisanship because for us, it's about voting and voters. It's about having a system that is run in a nonpartisan way to create our elections. But that also then means candidates need to abide by winning or losing according to math, according to the outcome of an election. And that will strengthen our democracy. Well, I think that that's a, it's such an important point, right? Civil society depends on, on common acceptance, not through laws, but through 
norms of, of certain uh, modes of conduct. And the idea that we can disagree, um, come to a vote, have a leader selected for a period of time until the next vote uh, comes out is, is so intrinsic to, to us actually having an America. The, the question that I have for you all is, is this, does this hyper-partisanship basically serve the function of dissolving the country? So that if you, Lewis, don't agree with me, you're on the other side. I'm not talking to you, right? And uh, Claire, if Tom disagrees with you, you're not talking to Tom. And all of a sudden, right, we've got, we've got four people on this. None of us are talking to each other because if you don't agree with me or you don't agree with me or you're, I'm making the perfect the enemy of the good. And all of a sudden, we have four people representing all of America, and we're not talking to each other. How do we act in common? How do we do anything together? Right. If we can't agree on our on our norms, Claire, how does that function? Is that part of what common cause is about? We're this is, I think you really articulated one of the key challenges very well with that. I mean, we, you know, it, it's like we never anticipated as a country. What if people just started just violating the norms and just, you know, taking power to the max and not having any regard for the a commitment to democracy for that those underlying values in civil society that are necessary in order to have a functioning um, democratic government. It's it's really hard. I mean, one of the things, and this goes back to something we were talking about a moment ago. Um, I think one issue to think about is closed primaries and open primaries. Um, we have a trend in among voters that people are leaving the parties. Right, they're becoming non affiliated with the two major parties. And in 14 states, we still have primaries that block those people from participating. And in many cases, the primary is where the decision is made of who's going to run. You know, in a gerrymandered district, if you know that a certain party is going to win, it's the primary where that selection takes place. But again, this is another example of the voters not being centered, right? Parties trying to use the mechanism to empower themselves rather than using the, the election to be about how can we get the voters involved? How can we allow them to have their voices heard? I mean, I think that's really important. And that might that might be a moderating influence if we could spread that idea so people can start coming together. Because I mean, honestly, if you look at public opinion polls, people aren't really as polarized as they, as they seem to be because it's just that you only have two choices and those two polls have gone um, farther apart. And so that's, drawing people to emphasize certain issues rather than others that they might find common ground on. Do, do the other organizations take any uh, position on other voting mechanisms such as open primaries or such as ranked choice voting where the um, where the vote is aggregated and then the second choice goes to you, you start to move uh, votes into different columns as the votes are counted and people are eliminated. Do you, do you all take any particular um, uh, positions on on the types of, of voting that works best to uh, provide a platform for Americans to articulate their will and come to a resolution? Lewis, do you have, do you have oh. take any? Yeah, at Democracy Works, we don't. We just ensure that whether you have ranked choice voting or you have, you know, a straight ticket or a straight primary, like we just want to ensure that the voters know what the rules are. And part of what's happening, um, and without taking any opinion on any of these um, various uh, methods for, for selecting candidates, the rules change and folks don't know that they've changed. And right. that's that that's the concern that we have, ensuring that that folks know when, where and how to vote. And um in a timely fashion, early, often. So that that's we stop there. Tom, do you have do you have any any particular uh, positions on these? Organizationally, we do not take a position on um, the methods of voting in a state. I will say, having served both in state and federal government, something that Claire said resonated: the gerrymandering of the last many years and the primary process. Both of those serve to pull the candidate pools toward extremes. And I often wonder what things might be like if there was some sort of computer program or sensible moderate way to construct legislative and congressional districts. And if primaries would were more open. 
we would likely have a democracy where many more people are working from the middle to find solution and fewer people are being rewarded for going to their corners. And as you alluded to earlier, having folks who aren't speaking to each other about reasonable solutions. Well, the middle is where things get done, right, Claire? Well, yes, but I also want to point out that the middle is not really the middle. <laughs> I mean, when one when one party's like, when there's certain factions that are pushing towards a fascist agenda, you know, the middle gets shifted, right? So the middle used to be coming together to support democracy, right? And so that might, you know, be a little, you know, I don't want to get too specific, but you know, the point being made that the it's not always a cutting into the middle because if if straight extremism occurs on one end or the other, it could skew. Um, yeah, this really point. bothers me. It bothers me during the Vietnam. It bothered me during the Vietnam era where the shoe was on the other foot. Right. Um, it bothers it, it. It's bothered me at various eras in, in American uh, history, but it is not new. Right. If you take a look at American history from different perspectives, disenfranchisement is the norm. Right. If you were uh, Asian, if you were black, if you were uh, Latin Hispanic, um, if you are a woman uh, in different era, um, disenfranchisement of, of different types. Um, hit a lot of people. Um, and this kind of um, this this um, extremism that is hitting us in which, you know, you're either for me or against me and you're on the other side and all this other stuff. It just is another articulata uh, articulation of that. How do we bring this together? I and mean, one of the things that I'm very concerned with is this balance between not conceding the point in other words, not basically bowing to extremism and changing behaviors um, that are focused on a free and level playing field and playing the game and then declaring a winner and loser and everybody can play uh, another day. So we need to stay there. Um, but we are constantly being pushed into these extreme corners. How do we talk with people who have completely different views of us than we do, but also believe in democracy. How do we get there, Tom? You know, back when I worked in Montana state government, there was a problem solvers caucus that was made up of the moderates from the Republican party and then the, essentially the entire democratic caucus. And they would take a look at taxation, budget, um, Medicaid expansion and figure out the ways through. I think you find the willing participants and do the work together. But you can imagine, we're simply talking about elections. In civil society, we have traffic laws, we have jury duty, we have taxes. Right now, we're at a moment where one party is seeking not to acknowledge the reality of electoral outcomes. If that same party chooses to begin to ignore taxes or traffic laws or jury duty or other parts of civil society, we'll really be in a pickle. So we need more voices standing up for civil society and a willingness to work together. We have to listen to each other, right? Yeah, we I mean, to... yes, but we also need media. Uh, that operates in a space. When I was younger, our media had a true north. Everybody knew what was true north. And now we have media out there seeking to give a different true north. Claire? I was just going to say that, I mean, we do need more voices. And so there's there's been, there are ongoing attacks all over the country on the, on the freedom to vote, voter suppression efforts, trying to turn back the clock and re-establish uh, Jim Crow disenfranchisement practices and so forth. But the solution to that has to be the opposite. And there are also movements across the country to um, bring more people into the conversation. For example, in Delaware, where we um, are fighting to get vote by mail, right? Same day voter registration, because <clears throat> voter, reg voter registration deadlines are a barrier to voting that's often not mentioned. Um, and, you know, early, we just established early voting. So all of these ways that we're trying, and these are precisely what's under attack, but we, you know, 
we're, we're fighting it out, right? And that's, that is part of the democratic process is, you know, trying to get your policies passed and, and so forth. So we just, we need to keep working to try to bring those voices in. Um, and hopefully that will um, lead to a better outcome. If I, might add, if I might add something to the conversation, um, the reliance on messengers um, might be a bit precarious right now because everything and every person in this country right now is polarizing. So I try to look at this at distribution channels. What are the safe spaces? What are the places where people come together and can actually have some civil discourse? And then you overlay that with where is civic education um, right now in the country? I mean, I suspect that the, all the folks on this call may have seen PBS, Schoolhouse Rock. You kind of came up with an understanding of how a bill became a law and these norms that we're talking about being broken down right now. They're also not being taught in the same way with the same frequency that they were 20, 30, 40 years ago. And I think that that's something that we need to recognize. So rather than trying to find that perfect messenger, that Peter Jennings or that Tom Brokaw, that Dan Rather, Walter Cronkite that we all believe at a certain point in time, where are the places and the spaces that people come together because they want to or they must? For example, your place of employ. And you start to inject civic education and getting people to realize and recognize these norms again that really built the democracy in this country that's where we're going to have to spend some time as well because right now um democracy and it's uh it's ship politics has been perverted and it's turned into um something that you watch on tv like you would a blood sport and that's not what democracy is it's about the free-flowing exchange of ideas and there was a time it's never been perfect because if you go back 40 50 years ago you're dealing with Jim Crow and segregation, but what's being done now is entertainment. And, um, you know, I'm a sports fan. I like my team. I don't think my political party should be rooted for the same way that my sports team is. And that's where I think that we really should spend some more time as a country is establishing the places and the spaces where people can have these conversations and learn more about civics. Well, I think that you're making a really good point. And, and if I were to bring all these points together, I would say that we each, each of us, and it doesn't matter whether we are in our identity as a voter, identity as, as being in business, identity of being a teacher, identity as being a media personality, we each actually carry within ourselves a responsibility to adhere to first principles of the country. And the first principles of the country include democracy, including include have everyone who is uh, enfranchised have the right to vote and have their vote counted that whoever wins wins right and and that that is honored right that we have civil uh discourse uh these first principles are the things that we carry as individuals it's a collective responsibility true but claire you're responsible for that lewis you're responsible tom i am responsible and everybody in this country if we're going to keep democracy together, we have to bear our portion of responsibility. Tom Lopak, President and CEO of the Voter Participation Center, Louis Lozada, CEO of Democracy Works, Claire Snyder Hall, Executive Director of Delaware Common Cause. Thank you so much for bringing these issues and bringing your work to our attention to uh, for your education of us as voters and for your support of the right to vote and the integrity of American. Uh, uh, of the American uh, vote and voter participation. Thank you. Thank you so much for helping us understand your life and your work.